So a more perfect union did something really interesting that I want to share with you guys. They uh, got Tim Walls to go to swing states and talk to uh, people who had voted for Trump in the past, but were open to potentially changing their minds. Right. So these are like working class people who at one time or another supported Trump, but they're not sure what they're going to do this time. And Tim Wall said, great, I'd love to meet them and talk to them. Maybe I can convince them to support me and Kamala. Right. So um, here, let's dive into it and then I'll have a lot to say about it. Hey, hey. Hi, guys. Oh. Well, I'm to you here. some voters right here. Oh. Hi, Tim Walls. I'm here in Erie, Pennsylvania, where we've organized a sit down with Governor Tim Walls. Hi, Tim Walls. Hey, hi, everybody. Good to see you all. And undecided working class voters. Hi, I'm proud to see you. I am a registered Republican, and I did vote for Trump the last election. I'm pretty mixed on it, to be completely honest. And I did vote for Donald Trump in 2020. We want to find out, what will Harris administration actually do to get wages up, prices down, and save American jobs? And how will they take on the corporate greed that's rigged our economy? And most importantly, will Governor Walz change any of these voters' minds? I wear with a badge of honor being maybe the poorest person to ever run for vice president in the history that they said. I'm a middle class guy, I got a pension, I don't own any stocks. I recognize we've lost some of the working class folks. We gotta get folks back. I'm Gordon Rowdy. I'm third generation farmer on our farm. I'm also uh, I'm a retired AFL-CIO, skilled union labor. Ah. So um, I haven't really totally made up my mind, but I'm leaning more for Trump, I think, because of the situation with the economy. So how'd you get back on the farm? Uh, I've always, I worked construction full time and, and farmed with my oh, father. So okay. my sister and I own it now together and we're still operating. What do you raise? Uh, we have uh, beef cattle. What should we do to make it easier? What would be the big thing? Uh, I think the biggest problem now is the price of the equipment has become so expensive. When fertilizer went from 450 to 950 a ton, that was devastating, you know? And then our chemicals tripled at that time also, you know? My farmers are getting about 410 a bushel for corn. That's what they were getting when grocery prices were 30% lower. They were still getting 410 then. The farmer's not getting any more money on this. Now, input costs went up for that farmer just as much as they went up for the, the middleman who's in there. Corporate profits have seen a bigger rise at any time in our history. So it's as simple as this. Somebody in the middle's taking more money. They're asking for a tax cut in the middle. Farmers aren't getting the money, and they're passing on the cost. So she's talking about stopping the price gouging on these things, making sure the prices are fair, making sure wages are keeping pace with that. And then it's no secret. Damn, he just broke that shit down for them. Like, bro, corporate profits are skyrocketing and you're on the struggling end of that. We're going to put a stop to that. Damn. The Democrats have lost working class voters, especially rural Americans. I will say, though, it's it honestly is changing. It's absolutely changing. And the reason it's changing is because of the infrastructure bill and the CHIPS Act and the Inflation Reduction Act. And under Trump, uh, he lost 200,000 manufacturing jobs. And under Biden and Kamala, we've increased 800,000 manufacturing jobs. So... It's tr like what they're describing is true for having the conversation in 2016, 2018, right? But now it's 2024 and the political reality has shifted on the ground. And it's very clear. Republicans are the party of outsourcing and tax cuts for the rich. And Democrats are the party of industrial policy and creating more jobs here. It's just, it's just reality. What stood out about Walls' approach to winning them back was his knowledge of their lives and specific struggles. He got into the weeds of farming with Gordon. Farm bill. What do you guys do on crop insurance? What equipment do you need with potatoes? Uh, like, how do you bring them in? Is it like sugar beets? You that, still make yeah. a living off 50 head. Yeah, correct. 2000. Yeah. And the details of trade policy with Dan. So my name is Dan Hand. I work at Mack Trucks in um, McCongee, Pennsylvania. I am a registered Republican. I'm going to support who's going to support labor. Boy, oh boy, do I have, do I have a message for you then, buddy? <laughs> I'm going to support whoever's better for labor. Really? Shall we compare NLRBs? Trump with a bunch of union busters in there, uh, you know, Biden and Kamala with a bunch of pro-union people. L let's have that conversation, dog. They are building a plant in Mexico. Yeah. And it's going to be building both Mack trucks and Volvo trucks. And everybody's really concerned about yeah. potentially losing our work. Yeah. And we're wondering as far as what the administration would do to help strengthen our, our plant domestically right. as opposed to with what's coming out of Mexico. Yeah, no, this was a big deal, and this is a double punch to you. In many of these cases, these folks were given a tax break, your tax dollars, tax breaks, to then offshore your job. And look, this started in the 80s and the 90s when we were saying that we would start shipping these jobs overseas, and then all of a sudden we started seeing the decline. Thousands of auto workers in swing states are worried about whether their jobs will be shipped to low-wage countries like Mexico. And who they vote for will depend on who they trust to renegotiate flawed trade deals like the US-Mexico-Canada agreement or USMCA. The other concern is as far as like, 
NAFTA 2.0, the yeah. U.S. MCA. Yeah. I mean, look what happened with John Deere. And they wound up losing a lot Deere, of work. a lot of rhetoric. And look, Donald Trump picked up on this. He picked up on that there was frustration. We were frustrated because the jobs left and all that. They told us that they were going to fix this, and it didn't get any better. We lost six auto manufacturing plants under President Trump's presidency. We've gained back 20. So I think being very clear that we end the policies that incentivize them to do that. We re-incentivize those that are willing to invest here. And things like the, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, the CHIP Act, and things like that, they are working. They are starting to come back. God, he's killing it, man. He's killing it. You could see them, like, changing their minds in real time. Those two laws, passed by the Biden-Harris administration, invest trillions of dollars in bringing manufacturing back to the U.S. after decades of offshoring. People like Jamie Sychuk are on the front lines of those global economic shifts. Jamie Sychuk, I'm a, I am a skilled trades card holder of the UAW. It's coming up on my 30th year. I work in a steel mill in Butler, Pennsylvania, and we make a unique product that's uh, electrical steel for transformers. Oh, he's, uh, Butler, Pennsylvania is where the uh, first assassination attempt against Trump happened, right? Holy shit. We're kind of tied to you guys with our taconite in northern Minnesota. Yes, I got to be totally honest. I'm still up in the air. I didn't. I love. I love how much Tim Walls knows about all the industries in Minnesota. <laughs> it's such an adorable, like hands-on governor type thing. I vote for Donald Trump in 2016, and I did vote for Donald Trump in 2020. Over the last 50 years, American steel jobs have been decimated by cheap foreign steel. The mill Jamie works at has been in limbo for years. Last year, with the Department of Energy, we had a rule regulation proposed that was nearly going to uh, wipe us off the map. Everything was going to come from overseas. What was the resolution on that? The, the resolution ultimately was uh, this past April, the rule accommodates the products that we make for this. But this is the heartburn I have. It was a very long, hard fought felt like a fight. to get that conversation to happen. All right. I, I think American workers like me and people in labor and just middle class workers need to know that, that an administration yeah, that's in charge has a voice at that and will be a consideration from day one if, if we're looking at not uh, proposing, after the fact, not right, fighting, proposing policies and, and regulations that those have impacts on jobs and real people. And we, we need somebody that's going to consider that from the ground up. Well, you certainly got my assurance, and I know the vice president has, has lived that way, and Joe Biden certainly did, is that we need to have you at the table. We need to avoid these things. We need to make sure that your voices of labor are heard. We talk about this being the most pro-labor. Uh, certainly not perfect. We've been through some of these, but I think you've got the assurance that things work better. We know this if you guys are at the table on the front end. And I'm really bullish because we're going to have to put steel in the ground on all of these, you know, clean energy projects. And then there's golden opportunity there for jobs, American jobs on green steel, you know, clean energy, American energy production. Sustainable and jobs for generations. You know, I'm third generation in my plant. My dad and my grandfather worked there. There should be jobs there for three or four generations no, to come. I think it, you're right. You're thinking about your kids on what, what jobs are they going to do. And then couple it with how they're going to buy a house. Um, I don't, want them, I don't want them coming out of school with debt. I want them having a skill and, and something to do. We're really pushing, and I know the Vice President's pushing it, this idea of skills, more apprenticeship programs, more opportunities to get in, build a stronger economy. They'll be thriving. Vice President mentioned addressing the price gouging. Um, a lot of people are struggling buying just basic everyday needs. I mean, I know she was saying that she's going to attack the price gouging, but how exactly? When we're talking price gouging, it's a fairness in the market. And I just give a couple examples of this. The one is we saw the hurricane coming and all of a sudden, airline tickets went up in Florida or whatever. That's not free market, that, that's unethical. Look, I'm not against anybody being successful. I want them to be successful, but they shouldn't be making insane amounts while they're jamming the price on that, especially on things you need to get. I, I talk about the last one I give you the example of is insulin. In Minnesota, they were charging for that little vial of insulin a month's worth, they were charging 800 bucks. We capped it at 35. Now people are saying, well, how's the company gonna make money? It costs $5 to make it. So. 37 states already have these policies in, but we don't have a federal ban on doing this that can stop some of that. That's the initial hit on that. But the biggest thing is, is making sure wages are keeping pace with it, making sure that we're, your taxes are going lower, making sure that healthcare prices aren't going up. Okay. He's freaking it. Holy shit. So Steelers going to win it? Is that the word? I'm just curious. <laughs> Look, I thought I would, I will admit this. I thought I was, smart. I thought I was smarter than Mike Tomlin. I said, what's he doing putting Russell Wilson in? And that's why Mike Tomlin's getting paid money to be a Steelers coach, and I'm not, so. You could tell he freaked it on that. So then he talks to one other voter, female voter, and then let's get to the part where they, uh, where uh, they ask him after the fact, hey, are you considering them now? Ag background and have the knowledge of, of the union trades and everything, so. Does it change the way you're thinking about this? Yeah, I think it does. Mm -hmm. I think I, I've definitely got to sit down and, and do some thinking. I, I have a lot more faith in this Harris and Walsh administration's uh, outlook for us. So it's, it's given me a lot more to think about. One conversation and these guys are like, yeah, you know what? I kind of like the guy. He's making good points. Jewel had to take off for her shift at work. So we called her later to get her take on the conversation. Are there any moments that stuck out for you? Well, I like that he asked me about my opinion on abortion. Um, it just really helped me decide kind of who I maybe want to vote for. Um, it just kind of um, helped my opinion in that way. And so I know you went in undecided. What What's your feeling uh, coming out of the conversation? 
I definitely feel like he was just so genuine and he was definitely like good answering my questions. So I just feel like I can definitely lean towards that administration. Changing their minds, baby. More so labor friendly people in the NLRB is a huge thing. Let's go, NLRB gang. What's up? Let's go, NLRB. Shout out. Shout out to this guy for uh, knowing about how good the NLRB has been. And uh, I'm seeing some things swinging in a positive way. We just want to keep it going that way. And do you, you feel like the Walls Harris administration will do that? I'm hoping so. And so when you go to cast your vote, how are you going to vote? I'm going to vote for Harrison Walls. One conversation with the man himself, Tim Walls, and every single one of them is like, you know what? I kind of, I kind of liked him. I kind of like what he's, uh, what he's talking about over there. And this dude right here, he seems to be the most knowledgeable. He brings up the NLRB, and he's like, yeah, I'm gonna vote for Kamala Harris and Tim Walls. Um, yeah, guys, look, it's, uh, it's not a close one, is it? It's not a close one. I just wish the media was good enough at doing their job where people would know some very basic things about Tim Walls. Like, for example, he was the governor of Minnesota, he had a one-seat majority, and he got universal free school lunch for kids, universal free school breakfast for kids, legal weed, 12 weeks paid family leave, 12 weeks paid sick leave, raised wages. Like, I just, just, just some of the things. We don't need to go through the whole list right now, but just some of the things that he did. I wish the media was good enough where they repeated that enough where everybody would go, oh yeah, that's the free paid time off guy. And then I think the numbers would go up more, right? So anyway, a uh, great job here from More Perfect Union and that's all it takes, bro. One conversation, keeping it real, explaining what your philosophy is and uh, relating to these guys. And that's that. Hey, y'all, do me a favor and like and subscribe. It helps out big time in the algorithm. Click the bell as well for notifications when videos drop. And watch that video on screen right now. You know you want to.